evening, everybody, and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Uh, BS stands for Building Science. Uh, tonight, our topic is a book club review of Essential Building Science by Jacob Berkusen. Um, my name is Ben Bogey. Uh, I am this evening drinking, if it'll allow me to do it. Oh, it's a shame. Hello. It's such a good... It's, this is uh, Buddy Sprinkles Saves the Day from uh, Put it in Kent front of you. Brewing. Yeah, I don't know if it'll do it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cat crossing the Delaware and a unicorn <laughs> shooting laser beams from its eyes. And it's just phenomenal. It's a friend of mine that does the artwork. That's uh, awesome. So BS and Beer is an independent grassroots movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups. And this, our Zoom show. The brew crew and our guests volunteer our time each week to bring up what we hope is a fun and informative discussion. Uh, we'd like to thank Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building for being our media partners and helping us on the back end to make this happen every week. And uh, most of all, we want to thank you for being in the audience to have this discussion with us tonight. So with that, Emily's got some announcements. All right. Evening, guys. Uh, in Maine tonight, uh, tonight's cocktail brought to you by uh, Jefferson Small Batch Bourbon with some ginger ale, right? So that's what that's what we're going for tonight. Ran out of cider. So although, you know, now if Jacob won and it being Vermont should have had some cider tonight. Right. But mess that one up. Um, okay. <laughs> if you're new to Zoom, the chat box is on the bottom of the screen. You'll see the chat box icon. It's probably already flashing. Make sure you introduce yourself in the chat box. so All of your friends know that you're here. They can't see you otherwise. Um, however, make sure that you pick all panelists and all attendees. Um, it has a tendency to flip back to just all panelists. So check every time you post that you are posting to all panelists and all attendees so that everybody can see your comments, your questions, and that you are here. Um, Find Home Building sends out a Zoom reminder every week. That's just a reminder to come to the show. If you want detailed information on what the show is going to be on and what the next show is coming up, make sure you pop over to the BS and Beer Show website and uh, get on our mailing list so that you get that every week. Um, the video recording from tonight's show will be up tomorrow on our YouTube channel and the blog post link from Kylie to link you there. We encourage you after the show, if your questions didn't get answered, to continue the discussion on Green Building Advisors blog post about the show. Um, that's also how you can find out what the next show is coming up for us on the BS and Beer show each week. Um, audio only version of the show is also available. If you're a podcast user, you can listen to it on all podcast players. I'm going to add some links to the chat box on here for Skills USA, BS and, and BS Fridays with Mark and Dave. Um, if you didn't see it earlier, they did a cross pollinator show. We want to support everybody who's out there bringing building science to the world. So uh, we made a fun little spoof if you didn't see it. Uh, Passive House Accelerator, my podcast, the Unbuild It podcast. And uh, well, normally we put book club on there, but you're too late. Mm -hmm. If you didn't read the book by now, tune in, buy it afterwards <laughs> and then read it. So um, now it's time for Travis to introduce our guests. Hello, I'm Travis Brungart and Emily's right. It's worth going back for The book's great. So we're going to talk about it and you're going to learn all the wonderful things that are in it, but you could still use the code and get it and it'd be worth it. So do that. Uh, I'm in Kansas City almost. Uh, my Royals, I think, are down one to uh, the Rangers today for our home opener. And I'm drinking a Free State Guavitas from Lawrence, Kansas, that was uh, gifted to me during a bid by my friend Nathan. <laughs> Showed up to do a bid. There was a cold six pack of sours. He's like, yeah, watch the show. Here's your sours. Enjoy. Doesn't get any better than that. But enough about me. Let's talk about our wonderful guest. Let's start with the author. Jacob Recusen, the author of Essential Building Science, is co-founder of New Frameworks, a Vermont-based, worker-owned, design-build cooperative committed to locally sourced natural materials and ecologically-minded building practices. Thank you for joining us on the show, Jacob. It's great to have you back. I'm excited to have you because this is a book that I recommended for several people that asked what a good starting point was to learn about building science. So welcome to the show. What did I miss in your introduction? What are you drinking? What can you tell us? Um... Yeah, you know, the introduction is plenty good. Uh, I won't add more words. I am drinking, I got you covered, Emily, on the cider. I'm not much of a of a beer guy. Um, and I don't know if anyone's ever had the Tomcat gin from Bar Hill. It's like a, a cask aged gin. So they're right in Vermont. And um, uh, a partner of mine, Ben, and I each got a 10 gallon uh, uh, wooden cask that they age their gin in. 
uh, when they are done using it. And I put about 10 gallons of our own cider in there last fall. So it's a cast aged cider. Cheers to you all. It's a pleasure nice. to be enjoying craft, craft beverages with all of you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor and a treat. I appreciate it so much. Well, cheers to you. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, our next guest is also a returning guest. This is Kyle Mocht. Of, he is a certified passive house consultant at Mocked Architecture. He started as an energy consultant for commercial buildings and new homes, eventually transitioning to the lead residential designer. Kyle rejoined Paul to create Mocked Architecture in 2015, and he's joining us tonight. What are you drinking, my friend? Uh, so I got to unmute myself. I've got two different drinks. One is a tea that my wife just made me, and I forget what it was called already. Um, and the other I have to support, uh, I was in my Positive Energy Glass, which is one of my favorite podcasts, and they sent me this. They do some of our mechanical designs. Um, so that's what I'm drinking. I wanted to say that this book is a great book. Wait, that's not the right one. Hold on. Um, that's a good one, too. Wait, no, sorry. Uh, no, nobody wants that. This one is fantastic. Um, it, I enjoyed it very much. However, I would say that I enjoyed the beginning a lot more than the end. Uh, I thought the the intro parts were just like, holy crap, everything that I've learned in the past 15 years summarized in a quick little synopsis. And like, this is the book I want to recommend to people who are like, where did you learn all this stuff? How do you give this? Well, instead of giving them like 20 websites to go to and all this different stuff, this is probably the book I'm going to be recommending from now on. Although I would love to see more in the, the second part of the book. So we'll get into that. But anyway. Well, thanks again for joining us, Kyle. It's good to have you back. And uh, great plug for Positive Energy. Christoph is who I always refer to as the spiritual leader of the BSN Beer Movement. And uh, yeah, we can't say enough good things about Positive Energy and uh, and their new bowling alley, which I'm sure we'll all be rolling out soon. Yeah, I want to I go and bowl there. Of course, it's not far for me. Uh, our next guest is June Donenfeld. She's a freelance writer, editor, and writing coach with special interests in green building, social entrepreneurship, education, and design also a regular audience member and was part of our last book called Discussion. So we're privileged to have her back. Welcome back, June. What are you drinking? There. Now, can you hear me apologize? Yes. Good. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no apology needed. What are you drinking? Can you see this? Wait. Uh, Put it in front of your chest. There we go. There you in go, Jacob's yeah. honor, this is from Vermont. Hey. I, um, uh, less, the background is not really where I am. I am actually in Maine. Um, I made, thought this made a nice change. And I was in uh, Trader Joe's the other day and I asked for a really dry cider because I like really dry ciders. And this is what they had. And it is called, oddly enough, super dry <laughs> with excellent <laughs> spelling underneath cider. Only, you know, those of you who can pronounce it better than I will, will do it for me. So there you go. I'm looking forward to this. I've never had it. <laughs> so our next guest, thank you again, June, for joining us. Our next okay. guest is Brian Wiley, and he is an assistant professor of graphic design at Boise State University, where he teaches courses in graphic design, user experience, and user interface design. And Brian, I have not met you before this, but I reached out to you through Instagram when we started talking about the book club. And I think your comment was, I'm really enjoying the book and I'd be happy to join you. So we're excited to have your input tonight. Uh, what are you drinking and tell us more about yourself? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm super excited to be here as well. I appreciate the invite and uh, such a great book to, and to be able to discuss it with you all is a real treat. Um, I am, since it's only four o'clock out here, I went with a hothouse jalapeno uh, session ale so it can... Um, kind of slow me down from guzzling this thing. It's from one of my favorite breweries here in Boise. So I figure that'll kind of pump the brakes on my consumption. Um, I, I think the introduction was perfectly fine. I, um, I have no, uh, no real building science qualifications. Occasionally I get to do work with the Hazard and Climate Institute at Boise State on visualizing air quality indexes with the, um, with the wildfires in the West that we're all kind of uh, experiencing, but that's that's about as close as I get. Otherwise, I've got a got an old house that I'm always trying to fix up. And by the way, we talked one time on Instagram. You were super kind, and told me how to air seal my vent, uh, my stove vent, actually, like how you would do it. Um, so, uh, and the house hasn't burned yet. Not yet. So uh, everything's good, right? Like the ex expert at distance. It's perfect. 
<laughs> well, I'm sure that that consult was worth every penny. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and more. How many homes to burn down, Travis, for recommendations <laughs> that you made so far? Is that a common occurrence? That's, a, that's just, uh, you know, kind of par for the course. You know, you, like I said, you get what you pay for with free advice. So, uh, <laughs> no, that's cool, man. I'm glad that I'm glad that you made that connection for me. I, I appreciate that. And uh, definitely glad to have you here because I think you'll have valuable input because this is, again, a book that I have recommended to numerous people for beginning their understanding on their building science journey. I think it's an excellent reference. Uh, I can go on and on about all the benefits that I've received from it. But uh, at this point, I think Kylie's going to kind of kick the show off. Is that right, Kylie? You've got some ideas? Yeah, I came up with some questions, but absolutely encourage everybody else to jump in. I I don't want to be the only one asking, but I just thought, you know, book club discussions, you kind of got to start someplace. So um, I'm Kylie Jacques, and I'm the senior editor at Green Building Advisor. I'm drinking peach tea. And whenever I have the opportunity to talk to an author, Jacob, I always want to know what inspired you to write this book. Um, And also in this particular case, I'm curious to know if there were topics that you found particularly challenging to try to convey in words. Um, So maybe you could start by answering those two questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The inspiration I'd say was sort of twofold. Um, Definitely credit for sure, Chris Magwood, who uh, was curating the uh, the essential book series for New Society. Um, and had, you know, was, you know, pretty, pretty pivotal in encouraging me to, to, to take the leap into, into penning something. Um, the other half of that was I had been directing the, uh, a program through the Estimar Design Build School, um, which is actually going on right now. It's the um, uh, certi- certificate in, see if I can remember all the words, certificate in building science and net zero design. Um, which uh, didn't really have a great like reference or resource for um, like intro level, like consolidated uh, kind of holistic sort of common thread uh, uh, building science information for, for new, new people. Um, so yeah, I needed to get something. I was, I was motivated to try to get a book together, some single resource together to use as a teaching guide for the program. Um, and Chris was, you know, very generous in encouraging me to, to add and contribute something to the essential series for New Society. And that's essentially how it came, came together. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, holy smokes, trying to convey all of this stuff in words. Whew, yeah, um, like all of it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I, will, I will say the, um, and I feel terrible. I can't remember the gentleman's name. And um, uh, Dale. Dale Brownson, thank goodness it was written down. Uh, he was the illustrator and the man is a hero in terms of being able to try to take my you know, crappy little like sketch ideas of these like physics principles that needed to be visualized and trying to make the invisible visible, um, which is always my favorite part of diagnostics, but trying to do that like in a book form and something you know, that was just drawn to suit. Uh, and good Lord, him trying to keep up with me through the revisions and the different ways of trying to actually bring visualization to these like heady physics concepts was, um, is here his work. So hats off to Dale for that, for sure. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, does, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't wanna take the floor here. I have other questions, but uh, so, anybody who read the book, uh, <laughs> the panelists, I mean, did you come away with uh, some key takeaways or, or questions for Jacob or? Anybody else want to jump in with some thoughts, questions? Yeah, but, wait, can you see? I, think I was going to say, here we go. June I probably has a whole page because right. we talked all about it the other day. We had our own book club before book club. <laughs> so <Some> committee. <laughs> um, actually, I, Jacob, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm with We're you. Good? Mm-hmm. Um, I had a question that was related to Kylie's question, which was that, you said one of the reasons that you decided to write the book was because you couldn't find something that really hit the spot for your needs for teaching. And what was it about um, what you, what was available that just wasn't good? Was it too complex or was it too simplistic? It just. I was really sure. So my, my 
pedagogical style is very much to like start super big picture and first principles and core like hydrothermal physics and really try to root and ground our understanding of how things work in buildings from just like the fundamental physics principles mm -hmm. and then try and like tie move from there into strategy and then move from strategy into detail and to try to sort of knit together the relationship between occupants and controls and enclosure systems and mechanical systems and I, in my, my, my sort of goal with both the program and then accordingly the book was to uh, really have like a, a connecting point that, that sort of moves in focus and moves in scale or, or scope, I suppose, um, across all those topics. So I had really good resources for like all of those different components. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like great physics resources and there's incredible like detail. I mean, there's like detail resources up the wazoo in terms of the application of physics and building design and detailing. And there's a whole bunch of really good strategy resources out there, but there just wasn't anything that kind of carried it all together without having someone read seven books or have to like weed out a whole bunch of extraneous information. Um, and so that's, there, that's, yeah, that was the, that was the thing that I was missing. So there was no combo platter. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And I, I just, you know, I, I take a systems, approach to teaching the way that I think we all take a systems approach to high performance design and applied physics. And uh, yeah, it just wasn't the like, the, the relatively quick read. And let me just say like, this could have been like five times longer. And so the real hard work was actually covering that breadth and trying to like squish it down to something that wasn't gonna completely intimidate and overwhelm the intro reader. So yeah, combo platter, I think is a pretty good <laughs> Pretty good way of, uh, of uh, languaging that. Yeah, totally. And I just, uh, I had a hard time talking and also seeing the chat. I just saw poo poo platter, like <laughs> in front of my eyeballs there. So we can Col just keep going with the analogies here. <laughs> Col Colbert with the priceless anecdotes. Ah, uh, yes, of course, of course. Now that I see you wrote that. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Jacob, um, speaking of systems, I, I, I noted in the book when I was reading it that you say that the most important takeaway in, this, in the whole thing is um, seeing bu buildings as whole systems, which makes perfect sense. But for somebody who hasn't read the book, m many in the audience probably, um, can you some, kind of summarize some of the thoughts that you, that you shared in, in that section where you're talking about, um, you know, how to view the building in that sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we come, I'm sorry, like the easiest way to answer this without being like overly heady, but really I, I, I was taught and I see like most of our either formal or even informal or trades or experiential education systems being pretty reductionist in their approach. And I don't mean that in a negative way, that's not pejorative, just like quite literally looking at things from like really small components and like individual pieces and then building them back up to see the whole. Like that's a, a really common way of us like engaging in science and trying to like understand how things work. Um, and it's also super tangible for folks that are new to things. It's like, all right, so like what tape do I use to apply to the thing to get the air barrier? Or like what is like, you know, starting from a place of like trying to understand materials or starting from a place of understanding like smaller details because they're easier points of entry because that's uh, tends to be what's um, easier to communicate in terms of like physical objects as opposed to heady ideas. Um, it tends to be from the world of mechanicals, like mechanicals tend to be really mystifying and confusing in general. I mean, even for those of us within the building trades, mechanicals usually tend to be the thing like, yeah, I just let my HVAC person figure that out. Like, it, you know, we tend to have um, more of a kind of a broken down compartmentalized approach into learning things. And that's super valuable, like to a point or for certain points of exploration. Um, for me, when it comes to actually defining a more like sort of cogent strategy of how do I want to approach this building or like what are my overall goals, I'm really big on like establishing really good goals in the front end. And then certainly in terms of like a systems approach for understanding a building, like you need to know what the individual bits and pieces are and the influences they have, but like that only makes sense if you can understand the relationships between the things. And so for me, there's such this, you know, a building is a small ecosystem within a larger ecosystem, right? So the way our buildings work are systems based, like whether we see them that way or not, like just by the fact that they exist in an ecosystem and respond to it and that we are creating a, a very small microclimate within the buildings that we have designed intentionally or unintentionally, like. It's a system's reality. And so for me to be able to start from the place of understanding 
the relationship between enclosure and the mechanicals that operate within that enclosure and the occupants that are um, maintaining and controlling those mechanical systems and, and the iterative relationship between those things sort of within the building. And then that's all in response to the building's relationship to the larger you know, ecosystem that's totally dynamic and changing all the time. Like taking that perspective is kind of critical. Otherwise you can't critically think your way through, oh, well, could I sub out you know, plywood for OSB? Or could I just swap out my natural gas boiler for a, you know, a furnace? And it kind of does the same thing. Like to be able to answer those questions in the full context and understand the implications, like it's, I think it's just really crucial to like honor and recognize that these things are all interrelated to be able to develop strategies to critically think through, well, how would I actually answer that question and know I'm not creating five other problems? Anyone want to jump on that thread? <laughs> I I will if uh, yeah I mean I think that was one of the one of the most enjoyable things about the book was that it framed it as a systems approach first and I think you know I'm only four years deep into home ownership and I think I actually described my house as old the other day and then and then realized it's like only from 1955 and for all you New Englanders <laughs> that's probably like just a a baby but you know like that's the most maddening thing about trying to approach any single problem as, as my house becomes kind of some of those systems become end of life is, you know, you pull, you pull one cog out of the, the, the whole thing. And it, it seems to affect every other component. And so that was one of the things I really appreciated about this book was it started with kind of systems and, and then goals within that to, to kind of look at it as a whole, as a whole ecosystem, like you said. I'm so glad that landed. Yeah, I mean, I think that was for for somebody that's very new to this and in all aspects, you know, like my my dad's a my dad was a builder um, and everything. So some of that's like relationally part of my memory, but nothing I've ever done. Right. Like um, I'm a professor. It's about as far away as you can get from from building on a day to day. Right. Like uh, um, and so. Well, I mean, I guess, yeah, we won't get into that. I build, I build things, but not, not like physical things. Right. And I'm, I'm used to a systems approach, but it's when you don't have that uh, hands-on experience, like y'all have, it can be really tricky to synthesize that from all those seven different books, which is again, I mean, these aren't questions, but um, I think just for anybody that hasn't read it, it really did like, make things that were really abstract before, or I, I understood how it was applied in principle, but didn't understand the reasoning why it clarified that greatly. I think the, the thing that I really appreciated about the first five chapters was how the systems approach to it, but also the approach from um, a natural building methodology, as well as sort of, let, let's not just talk about the physics, but let's also talk about the choices that we're making and how that impacts our world. And I really appreciated that because that's something I've not seen. It's something I've learned over the past 10 years, but not really seen written. And I think that's another reason why um, you had to write this book, I guess, is to get the, the natural side into it. And not just because of, you know, all of us being tree huggers and whatnot, but really from a climate change perspective and from a, a health perspective um, of why you're choosing to write the way you did. And I really also like the way um, that you, you intertwined some of the things about the water molecule and some of the work that Joe, John Straub had done over the years and what he's written about that. I really appreciated that in the book because sometimes it's easy to not see the bigger picture of what's destroying my building. It's, you know, it's not water in general, it's the molecule level and you know, getting it into absorption and adsorption and sort of talking about the in-depth detail about those different topics. I really appreciated doing it in a simple way. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. And now I feel like that is something I can easily say, hey, go read this. I've, I'm meeting with a new, um, it's somebody who's new to the industry tomorrow on Zoom and I told him to pick this book up. And so he's been reading it apparently. Um, and so anyway, I, I very much appreciate that. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. And good Lord, I wish I could, this is like, five years old at this point. I can't tell you how much I wish 
I could write this entire thing over right now. That was I one of my questions. That, that was one of my questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What good, has changed? Good. And yeah, it's amazing. I think I was thinking 2017. I had to think about it. I was like, well, that's not that, but so much has changed, right? Oh, and my Lord. especially in your field where you are working with more bio based materials. And uh, yeah, so that would be a, a topic to dive into. Oh, yeah. yeah I, well, I was going to say, I haven't been watching the chat, but I think somebody already asked for an addition to or 2.0 right. or something in the chat box. And, you mm -hmm. know, what I appreciated about it from one instructor to another is this was like a great halfway between the science book where we teach all of the science stuff and my design book, which is way too designy for a lot of things. And I'm like, oh, look at these graphics. That's what I draw on the board when I have to explain this to people. So now I can just copy <laughs> to draw. So I really like to kind of, you know, the, the in between, like, okay, this, this is all the stuff that I describe graphically that it's not in the science based book where you're teaching heat loss or, you know, really like how does physics work? But it's way more complicated once you get to all of the, you know, the here is the architectural wall section with all of these things that have all been, you know, like the, where was the in between there? So I really appreciated that. For, for me, it walks a good line between like, you know, a, a scientific or physics based, like a Gus Handegord book or Joe Stebrick or something. And uh, somebody writing a tome on how to build an earth ship. So <laughs> it's, it's a realistic, it's a perspective that we need in the industry because both of them have to, weigh in equally when we approach buildings we can't have either side for everything so props to you for striking a nice balance there but, um, yeah i am curious how traditional builders or production home builders might take a book like this and somebody in 40 years in the yeah i was going to say maybe travis has an answer <laughs> travis, for that. Um, travis is the one that the, recommended this to, book i think yeah i meant to mention the picture behind me so that's me right there uh, working on one of my first straw bale uh, projects over 12 years ago now, um, but that was back in college days. But so I've already been primed for that type of construction and that type of thought process. Um, but for maybe for Travis, and maybe his opinion is a little different, but I'm, I'm curious sort of how I loved it, but I'm wondering for production home builders, like what kind of garbage is this? Like there's, there's too much <laughs> here for me to, to legitimately appreciate the the substance in this book but well, maybe well, travis if you can find a, a production builder that's willing to read a book about building then you're already <laughs> doing well <laughs> it's a great point yeah i have to with i just have to clarify something i raised my hand excitedly not when you said a production builder because i am a production builder but because i came from working for a production builder that was my first home that i built was under um, a production builder mindset and while the focus of that company was pretty high end production, it was still, you know, production homes. So that's where I want to really credit uh, Jacob and Dale, uh, because this is, it's about imagination for me. I, I don't want to go soapbox so early in the show, but I, I almost can't resist. Go, this is such go, go, go. <laughs> I wanted you here. Step on up. Okay. It's super important to me that we uh, include imagination uh, opening in, in all of these sorts of discussions, because as someone that came from two by fours in Tyvek uh, in what they call in my market, single wall, there's a lot of homes still built in my area, even a few years ago that didn't require exterior sheeting. You could lay up your studs, roll out some house wrap or whatever you want, and then go ahead and put up T111 and you're done. You're, you're ready. And then Wait, even in, even with Midwest winters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, insulation was required, but an R13 fiberglass, fiberglass bat was adequate. Uh, right by code. So that's the build that I used to do 20 years ago. And so that was my introduction into this is how we make big, nice houses, because these were expensive. They were very nice homes. They weren't high performance homes. So not to talk about my story in building science, but to just explain the value of this book to me was normalizing the idea of natural building materials. Um, I, I watched that documentary Garbage Warrior, and I love it. I love the idea of an earth ship. I love that there are people uh, in other parts of the world that are ramming earth into tires and making homes for their families to be naturally conditioned. And I can get all hippy dippy on all that stuff, go, go. but I'm a regular, like normal Midwest builder and nobody wants that from me. Nobody's coming to me for that at all. 
but what they do want is comfort and they want durability yet though they want a beautiful home and so when i see an article in fine home building about uh lime plaster over straw bale Mm -hmm. like there was last year which was a beautiful piece the photographs i uh stunning and i see a book like this and i'm reading it and understanding physics and seeing drawings that explain why things fail and why they succeed in a way that i can understand as someone who didn't take five years of master's courses in college, but actually just put my hands on tools for 20 years. This gave me the opportunity to consider that in a very equal footing. I never would have thought about straw bale as a viable building material until this book. And I'm a regular Midwest builder. So you won me over pretty early on. And it's funny because the guy that recommended this book to me, Joe Nichols of Thrive Building Solutions is a like super high performance guy in my market, really sharp guy all the, you know, arrow barrier, Alpen windows, really top performing systems, Zender rep. He was like, you got to read this. And I called him like two chapters in and I'm like, yeah, your straw bill book's stupid. Uh, <laughs> but it has some cool drawings and the reference material is actually pretty helpful for me to understand these concepts that I haven't really been able to grasp and express to other clients. So I'm laughing as I turn the pages about where anyone would actually take the straw from my grandpa's farm and then try to sell it as a house. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but by the end of the book, you won me over. So I think, you know, I'm not an early adopter. I'm a Midwesterner. We're the late adopters. Parachute pants, still rocking, man. <laughs> I want to give you tremendous credit for delivering a book that could take someone who's not necessarily super open-minded to natural building materials and be like, no, I'm, I'm definitely interested in this. Where can I learn more? Uh, so props to you and Dale, the illustrations are still handy reference for me. I, I really mean what I say when I, I, I love this book. I recommend this book often. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for the good work that you're doing in the world uh, of reminding people that it's not just, saw and lumber and press board uh, products with lots of glue and binders. There's a lot of natural alternatives that could be mainstream and could save us from our carbon debt. Thank you. I think that's the, so great. Sorry, Kyle, go ahead. I just want to say thank you. Yeah. That's like, thank you. Huge praise. Actually one really quick response then Kyle, jumping back to you. It's a particularly validating coming like from a, owner builder and then builders way into all of this. Like I did not come from an academic perspective. I was not like, you know, trying, I didn't come at all of this from really wanting to like prove out the science. We were trying to like validate what we had empirically known to be true, which is that these materials and methods work in this region. And Vermont is like rugged in terms of getting a building to stand up over the test of time. Um, and the first book we wrote um, that I co-wrote with Ace McCarlton, my, my co-partner uh, in crime, um, like that was my introduction into building science was actually to write this book and try to promote these techniques around natural building. Like we have to be able to validate this and back this up and like actually make sure that this is legit. And we went and did a whole bunch of um, blower door and th- IR thermography and, and pin and scan and probe moisture testing of a bunch of buildings we built. And like, I had to get into the science to really actually be able to validate these practices as being legitimate for our own sake to make sure we could like keep doing this incredibly high risk thing as we actually started doing this for other people and then start to try to advocate and evangelize for it. Um, you know, it's like definitely the neck was stretching up really far away from the body into a whole bunch of like highly critical folks as well that they should be. Um, and so, you know, hearing you then say that that was, you know, that was like what was required of me to be able to actually substantiate the work and then to hear that that, that landed from that angle from you to validate the use of these materials as acceptable is, um, that's, that's really helpful and I really appreciate that feedback. It totally did. And to give you even one more feather in your cap, the, <laughs> the way that the reference tables included a direct comparison, like you weren't, you weren't sugarcoating anything. It wasn't like, here's the straw bell page and this chapter is on natural building components. You quite literally put fiberglass and sheep's wool in the same table. So there wasn't any like, oh, I'm trying to push this agenda. It was very much a comparative analysis in, in my humble opinion. So that still works for me. I still reference your book. Uh, and now I will uh, cede the floor to Kyle if you still have your point at hand. 
I do, but I'm glad you cut me off because that was a great conversation there. Um, it, going off on those tables and those different thought processes, the one thing I really liked was how straw and um, lime plaster and all of the natural building methodologies didn't seem abnormal in the way you wrote it because a lot of the examples, a lot of the pictures were, oh, that's a straw bale, you know, construction. Oh, look at that methodology. So you're showing it all like it's normal and talking about it sort of like it's normal. You do mention sometimes where that's not the standard type, but uh, ultimately I read this thinking, oh, this isn't different, that this is just how some other people do it. And I think that's really good because sometimes from a systems perspective, that's where we really fail in our building industry of, oh, oh, I've got my two by six frame wall with my exterior sheathing. Oh, so straw. Oh, that's another thing. Let me try that. Oh, that's only R9 in that two by six stud. Well, forget that. I'm not using that. Oh, closed cell spray foam. That's really high. Let me use that. And so it's, it, that's where the system approach is really important and where it breaks down in the typical way that I think production home building and most of building happens in the United States is we tend to swap out product for product mm -hmm. um, and not swap out the entire system and the entire thought process. And even some of your details, especially at the end, you're like, hey, you can take layers one through five and condense them all into, you know, three layers of, of lime plaster. And so I, I appreciated that thought process of, hey, we can transform some of these assembly details into other methodologies. Um, but I, I do think systems thinking is sort of the critical part of what this book achieved that often is a challenge in our industry. In, in that vein, uh, Chris Magwood just had a good comment that I noticed here in the chat. How much um, money did he make from the book? <laughs> well, yeah, how, <laughs> how rich did you get from the book? <laughs> that was Chris's but, uh, comment, I just wanted to say. But uh, <laughs> about how you make a good argument for uh, making vapor open uh, conventional assemblies. So you get the same hydrothermal kind of properties as you do with a bio-based wall system, um, but in a more conventionally, you know, constructed approach which is you know as most of you probably know that's where I push a lot of my work too so it's nice to be able to ride that balance and you know Chris brought up a good point I'm also happy to see that approach you know highlighted and uh, brought to the forefront yeah we just had a session in the this year's um, certificate program um, and we're talking through the the moisture balance uh, concept right the that it's not just the like impenetrable fortress approach to moisture management where it's, you know, WB on the outside, vapor barrier on the inside and we're good. That there's like, and there's storage and there's drying potential. And like, you only really get to take advantage of those if you have some understanding of the direction of vapor drive and like what wow. the climate relevance is. And so I completely appreciate why it's like a bit of an, it's not just like a linear, but like an exponential curve. It's like, oh, wow, now I have to like make decisions about like how permeable is permeable and do I have sufficient drying potential? And we got this whole conversation of like when you're in a basement and looking at the vapor like profile or direction of drive, and then you go literally like one foot up above grade and it's an entirely different circumstance. And like your whole assembly is gonna change and the whole like moisture regime is gonna change. and. Um, and you have the opportunity for working with storing materials and materials that can dry out and using that as an active strategy because it's total hubris to expect that we're just gonna keep all the vapor and all the liquid moisture out and we're good. Like that's just, good Lord. Like that, when that, has that ever worked for, I mean, we do a ton of remodel and retrofit and old building work. I'm like, oh yeah, I can just see like human arrogance like everywhere in terms of these details thinking that it's actually gonna last for a long period of time. Like we're not that, you know, powerful and controlling the forces of nature. So but, yeah, I'm I, glad I, I feel I feel like a lot of like the exterior foams and the foam products and the plastic usages and the barriers and stuff like that are just a short-sighted attempt by us. Like, oh, this stuff is bad. We have to block all of it out. And just to your point exactly there, that's why I'm recoiling in fear away from those things because I, you know, I live in New England. I work on 250 year old houses for most of my career. It's never going to last. And as soon as you introduce any failure into that system, there's no ability for it to overcome it. You know, we're, 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 we're creating time bombs. So, uh, you know, just being able to read a book like this and start to wrap your head around the nuance of how a building performs as a system and just, you know, on, on the micro and macro level. And then it informs your ability as a, a builder to make 
at least make choices instead yeah. of just going with the product that's on the shelf and everybody else is buying. Totally. So Jacob, I have a question um, and uh, I won't hold you to the answer, so don't <laughs> worry. Um, but from what you've seen of the US building industry so far, what would be some of the most effective ways to, and it may not be in our lifetimes, but to move towards some kind of tipping point in terms of building that's better for us and better for the planet. Um, you know, I know you have to, and that's a huge question, I know this, you know, it has to do with, with policy, it has to do with a whole bunch of things, but what, what do you things. think? All the things. All yeah. the things. <laughs> um, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, I'm going to try to like consolidate them and answer it really kind of quickly and broadly. And oh, we could spend all night talking about change. Um, I think I see it very much in two major categories. And then there's like a thousand subcategories within those. Um, and uh, geez, for some of you may be familiar with like the work I've been doing more recently since this book came out around the use of biogenic materials and buildings as carbon storing uh you know building this carbon sinks and like and sort of that next level of materiality and relationship to both the immediate landscape and then the atmosphere and carbon balance in the planet so i'm kind of answering from that perspective a bit um but that also incorporates health and impact and durability and longevity and all the other fundamentals of science that this book was more talking about so i see two main like areas in which we can really enact change one is absolutely in policy and regulation. And that's not necessarily, that's a like carrot and stick. And right, it's right, right, right. to be able to like make big change, especially for larger scale development or for the decision-making that is heavily influenced by a regulated marketplace, which the building industry is very regulated. We respond to code, we respond to market forces, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like action there and action in policy and action in regulation and whether that is um, you know, better prescriptive pathways for meeting code that, that are more like responsive to actual science or to impact beyond, you know, uh, like, you know, 1980s concepts of uh, building science is like, that's certainly, that's certainly one of them. And then as well as policy that incentivizes um, climate action through the development of the built environment. Like, yep, so is that whole policy regulation, you know, industry big scale side of things. What I think is every bit as effective, if not actually more effective and more impactful and more necessary is movement building amongst um, particularly smaller businesses, smaller companies working on smaller buildings because the majority of um, square footage built in North America uh, on a per annum basis, new construction is, is in low rise construction. And those, the decision-making for how those buildings are built are distributed amongst 100,000 different owners and small companies and small firms. And, um, and you know, when I got into the carbon work, um, I saw most of the like biggest work being done by larger companies working on larger projects that had the sort of decision-making power consolidated on, amongst a smaller number of people that could make bigger decisions and like make a bunch of stuff happen. And what I get really excited about is actually now having these conversations and having this land amongst um, you know, this community, which granted there may be folks working on skyscrapers and like really large scale developments in the audience. And um, I would actually love to hear if that's the case. I'm having a hard time keeping up with the chat, but in general, like that'd be really cool. My, my kind of general world and my impression is that, no, this is like movement building amongst a whole bunch of us working in like a broad diversity of markets with a broad diversity of climates with a pretty decent spread of different materials, especially if you get into the natural building world and you've got different material resources, you know, we have a lot of wood. Other folks don't have so much wood and other folks have more masonry skills and trades and they may be working towards earth construction or, or what have you. But like the ability to enact change when we're collectively working on a shared set of goals from um, like a well-organized distributed base of power and decision-making is like, that's how that we've always seen major social change in our in our country, you know, and it comes from both the top and from the bottom. And both of those are powerful leverage points 
Um, I just don't want to sit around and wait for regulation to catch up because code moves at a snail's pace and I'm not relying on the federal government to set a whole lot of pace. And the, you know, states are generally broke and have a pretty, you know, broad mix of their engagement in Vermont. Like we have zero residential building code, none, unless you happen to be in a municipality with a municip with like a city that recognizes it. Like they don't even keep a list of general contractors in our state. I mean, that's where we're starting from. So it's not going to come from the top down. And so we got to, we have to move it, Bill, if we're actually going to improve the state of things and the market has to demand better results. And those of us that are providing to the market have to like educate and show. And I love Travis that you mentioned, like, it was like, you know, uh, it like it showed like inspiration and imagination. Like for me, that feels like the work that we have is to, like highlight with joy the a vision of what is possible because most folks don't even recognize they have these options or that you can even do better. I mean, I just say that from like even recognizing that your contractor is not out to screw you. I mean, just like showing that there's like a vision in which there's like a collaborative relationship between designers and builders and owners all working towards the same goal. Like that is a radical vision. And like those types of relationship building and reframing is actually what allows us to then make better material choices and make better design choices and set higher targets for goal setting and actually apply some real metrics to those goals so that we can ask better of our infrastructure. And so I get really excited about that. And that's the part where like my spirit lives and also policy and regulation goes a really long way. And I'm super pumped for all the folks that are trying to get embodied carbon standards and like carbon metrics, not just energy metrics built into energy code and, and HERS rating indices and all those other places where you know, those have a huge influence on how we all practice. That's about short of a way I can answer that question. I'm going to stop right there. I have so many things to say. Uh, first one is, um, don't worry if you only see like one in every 50 in the chat box. Like, I don't know. It's hard to be on the screen and see the chat yeah, box. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to look at you but, all. And I'm like, but oh, like, like Mike awesome. and Ben are good at that, but, but yeah. nobody else is. The second mm -hmm. is, can you read your book in that same enthusiasm? Because I think as an audio book with like ah. some visual mm -hmm. aid presentation, like, it was so exciting just to listen to you talk. If people weren't inspired just by listening to you talk right there, like, I don't know. Um, but a, a question came up. And so you're not in the chat box. This isn't grill the author night, right? Um, a question came up in the chat box for Travis, which I think follows along this line, which was, Travis, how do you think we get other builders to get your level of enthusiasm mm -hmm. that you had? Like, you were also really excited. Like, how yeah. do we get, um, especially I recorded with Steve Basic for the last... Well, it, we only recorded once, but it's too long because he and I talked for two hours. So sorry about that, <laughs> but it was great. And you have to listen to it all. So, but he also said that he, he's like, yeah, I don't really like books. So, you know, if it's not a book thing and that's a comment that we get a lot, I think mm -hmm. in the construction industry is like, oh man, you know, to read water and buildings, right. That is like a textbook. Like who, who's, you know, like how do we get or, 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 you know, do you have any ideas, uh, Travis, on how, how to get this level of enthusiasm? I mean, you talked a little bit about how you decided to read the book, but I don't know. Thoughts? Good question. Yeah, that's something that uh, I'm working pretty hard at. Uh, actually, the this isn't a commercial for the Midwest Building Science Symposium, but that's the that's basically the reason we started that. We're, we're trying to influence people in our market to share information. The BS and Beer movement inspired that. That's This is what we're doing. We're, we're, and th this is why I always defend the, the case studies about really expensive per square foot, beautiful passive houses that are far away and have expensive elements that are exceptionally designed. The, the ability to inspire is very special. And I think that it does work on regular builders as long as you take it, you have to bring along the performance aspect that and for the for the perform or excuse me that for the production guys you also have to bring along the cost metric and as soon as you couple those together as soon as you say yeah you can upsell your client on these beautiful hand finished plaster walls and oh by the way they're very durable they're going to provide thermal mass and you're going to get a performance benefit and your client's going to love how quiet it is and look at this beautiful deep window sill that everyone wants for the decor as soon as you connect the money for the production builder and then, you know, you say, well, this labor force is going to come along too. That's a good step. But the inspiration side of it is so critical because if you don't, if you don't know that that thing exists, if you don't know about the red list, if you don't know about living building challenge, you don't, 
it just never occurs to you as a builder. You're, you're just, you're going through the day and trying to nail the boards together and get the WRB up before the wind picks it off the wall. But as soon as you understand the bigger picture, as soon as you grasp the, the reality beyond your, your existing project and what's in your hand right then, then you can really make that difference. So I think that the way that you actually do that is with these conversations. You buy 200 people pizza and beer and you sit them down and you tell them, hey, this is a thing that exists. Look, this material is affordable and renewable and people will pay for that because it does matter. And you can have a comfortable place that's quiet and you can enjoy it for generations. It's not going to go in the landfill in 20 years because the water management detailing sucks. So I think that's how you do it. I think that's what worked on me. I have met other builders at the local BS and beer that are of the same sort of background where we, we didn't come at this to be ecologists. We came at it to make money. We, we wanted a job that we could do and feel good about. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you can't make someone care if they don't, but you can certainly bring them along for the ride and at least show them the way that they might be interested in. And there are a lot of opportunities and, you know, some people are opportunistic. I think that's the, that's the cell or the, the, the gateway, the door in. And if it's not the book, then yeah, have Jacob read it, have, have Steve Basic act it out. Let's have some fun. <laughs> I want to see it. Theatrical rendition. Oh, that's, wow. That's quite a visual. <laughs> Steve's handsome 150 pound frame has done amazing things on the Build Show Network. I don't see any reason why he wouldn't want to demonstrate any of these concepts. I, I'm sure he's going to kill me later, but I definitely. I'm so excited. He's on right now and listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a they HBO just apparently bought the book somewhere. <laughs> he'll be here in, in September and he'll be talking about these concepts. It, it just takes us having the open conversation and the level of enthusiasm because it is contagious. Uh, I think, I don't know, I, I would be interested to, to hear other people's perspective on that as well. But as, as the Midwest builder, token builder guy, that's, that was the end for me, was better performance, something I can be proud of, legacy, making a, a world that my kids will be able to survive in and that their kids can survive in because we have clean air and water and things aren't all piling up trash around them. I, it's as simple as that for me. I think but my perspective is the, at least a way that I've seen a lot of guys come into finding some interest in building science is a uh, kind of out of fear. And it, it's sad to say that, but uh, when you see guys putting a half inch of foam on the outside of a two by six fiberglass insulated wall in a cold climate, and you go, oh, isn't there a condensation risk? And they go, what do you mean? Or then you have somebody that all of a sudden has to replace, you know, half a dozen windows in a house or a project that they just finished because they're all leaking. You know, it's that fear of losing money or that fear of tarnishing your, your reputation or that fear of the unknown. Uh, generally, that's what I've seen, at least in a lot of the older guys in my area, that's what brings them around to, to start paying attention and having those conversations. And it's really just about, I, I guess, it, like you're saying, Jacob, it's about having that movement or having that conversation so that the, you know, there's more people out there that are at least aware that this section of the industry exists. And if I could just, I love that. I love what you both just said. And if I could just maybe like add a little like footnote to my like idealistic rant, like that's what I get stoked about. And that's what makes me feel like I can wake up in the morning and keep facing like all of the trials and tribulations of like my own little corner or the global tribulations of the world i don't want anyone to have to feel like they're like mission driven to be able to do this stuff like i just want it to be done like just to be super clear like this shouldn't have to be an activist's like you yeah. know like struggle no. to like do better building it should just be like really easy to do the right thing and to have buildings work and to have them not destroy our planet and our occupants and ourselves like that's actually the goal that it doesn't even have to be a conversation and there's a hundred ways in like you're mentioning it can be because you're an eco warrior it could be because you care about health it could be because you're trying to protect your investment it could be because you're trying to build a hundred year house it could be because you're trying to like cover your ass and you're detailing it could be for a competitive advantage. Like they all lead theoretically or potentially to the same material profile, the same, you know, decision-making, same logic. I mean, not inherently, but they all could. And so if all those are different angles into like doing better detailing, using better materials, like 
I don't actually need to have everyone enrolled with saving the world. I just know right. that's what makes me excited. And there's a potential I see there for those that are looking for those solutions and for folks that are just trying to like get through their days and not lose their shirts in a super high risk industry. Cool. Like all these yeah. same solutions are like means to an end for those goals as well. And like, that's great. We can meet everyone where they're at and also not have to kill ourselves in the planning process and have our buildings rot in 10 years. Right. One Even thing if that you're... I wanted to say about the book. So oh, no, go ahead. The, no, go ahead. One cool thing that I like, but also I think potentially could be a missed opportunity is so far, all of the examples of, of work are mostly your projects, which is really cool. Um, but you guys do specialize in a very special type of construction usually. Um, and I wonder how much that might turn off the client or the home builder that's looking for something super modern and sexy. And they read this book and they're like, oh, none of these look like what I want. So this book's not for me. And even though the building science applies to all different categories or if it's colonial or whatever it is, it might be interesting to get maybe in the color pages or something, um, other examples of other high performance designs or sustainable low embodied carbon uh, designs that are, are sexy or more colonial or more, more simple or whatever, but besides just the cool projects that you guys are doing. Yeah, Kyle, if I could um, throw that on the list of like next edition pieces. And I'm we sure had actually, long. I had a huge conversation with Chris about this. Um, I think Chris is on here. Feel free to like chime in, bud, with your, with your thoughts there. Um, we had a really big conversation about how broadly to cast this net. And ultimately, this is part of the essential, the sustainable building essential series. And like the focus is very much on natural building solutions and approaches and like alternative materials. And so <clears throat> there was definitely at the end of the day, like an editorial decision that we made to like really highlight and lean into that. And like, I feel like relieved, honestly, the word that I would use to describe my like emotional reaction to Travis's like explanation is like relief that that actually landed for folks that aren't like natural builders or like looking for that, that it was actually relevant and applicable to that world. Um, and Kyle, to your point, yeah, I think it would be like really sweet. There's like, that's one of, I think like a series of four or five different like major like points of improvement for the next edition or like areas that could definitely be I would love to see this expand into or <clears throat> version two or, or what have you would be to like generalize this further, take like a, a broader, uh, you know, actually cross more into the conventional and show more examples of how both in the building science and then also the, the specifically uh, climate and carbon impact side of things. There's like, actually, there's a whole lot within the conventional world that's working and relevant and legitimate that could be, that could be shown here. So I, I agree with you in that. And that's yeah. totally legit but feedback. At the same time, the way you phrased it is it's focused in the natural building world. And that was why it was written. So that yeah. totally makes sense. The problem is there's not any other building science books that I know of <laughs> that address the same type of stuff in the same way. And that's where the, you know, maybe this is the book and it expands to all different types instead of just natural. Um, although I think natural is the way to go. And, and but it's, that's where uh, one thing that I think could help uh, another, so to be a little nitpicky while yeah, I started with, go. Um, so the the window section, I just felt like I <clears> wanted more. Um, and I felt like it was just, I feel like that's often a conversation where with a new client or with a builder, they come to me and they're like, oh, we're going with the best windows we can, Renewal by Anderson, or, or you know, we're going Marvin and that's it. And their mind isn't expanded enough to to see all of the other options out there. And you do get into that, but there's more there. And I think it, not necessarily that you need to get in politics of why Europe is different than the United States in terms of how that, you know, changed the window technology over there. Um, but it, most people just think, oh, European windows, that means if, even if they are thinking in body carbon, they think, oh, the shipping is going to be too great. Well, it's actually not that bad. Um, or the European windows, they're going to be so expensive. Well, not really, not necessarily, depending on how you what you're doing. And so I think I, I would have loved to see like a whole chapter on windows, maybe, um, instead of just the three pages. It may be, yeah. But I, I think that's, I'm trying to think this is, if I'm giving this book as the book of, hey, you're new in the industry, or hey, you're a client who really wants to know and understand, <laughs> here it is. There's like windows, I want them to know a little bit more. The other area that I thought was just a little lacking was the systems side of things. Like and mechanicals. It, yeah, mechanicals. Oh, I and totally agree with you. 
Yeah. So, I mean, that could have been at least its own chapter, if not ventilation, its own chapter, and then heating and cooling conditioning, its own chapter with filtration talked about and all of that. seems like you, you already know all that, but um, <laughs> yeah, like, oh, that God. would be, that would be the two sort of, the, the system side is certainly something I'd want to add to and, you know, maybe two more chapters in there and then a little bit more on windows. But the, the other little thing that I thought the, in, in the assembly sections, I thought those were really fun and really cool. Uh, there was one thermal bridge in one of your pictures, actually. Um, oh, but there was, good, good uh, let me see, hold on. I, I, have a, I have a marked up copy with a bunch of like, oh my God, how did that get published moments in there? Right, so right. you can like, so anyway, where's sure Waldo? All the like talk. physics mistakes that I <laughs> ended up seeking in there. <laughs> so, but the, the one thing that I thought was interesting that you sort of started with, here's the picture that I was trying to, so here you're, you've got insulation in the rim there and then insulation here, but you didn't connect the thermal ah, control layer. Yeah, I think so, I anyway, that. What, I what page is that on? Uh, page 87. Oh yeah, I have that circled. Okay, cool. I'm like, yeah, I should have so, left over the rim. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just so, like there's an and, editor's cut, or excuse me, yeah, director's right. cut. We yeah. want to make sure that we get the editor's uh, version out there so that people can like enjoy all the comments. That that would be part of the audiobook, I would assume. But <laughs> make that happen, please. Yeah, and I think the essential oh. windows being the next book that you write, it would be great because I swear we explain windows to every single client every time. Like, even if you just make that a little pamphlet, I'll take like a hundred of them. It was handed out. I'd be like, read this, then come back and tell me what you thought right and with I every mean, client it's different sometimes i feel like the explanation works really well and then sometimes it's like well i failed on that one they didn't get it and <laughs> they don't care so look you all want to lay out that pamphlet i'll i'll gladly design it up for you hey, hey. this is how hey. things happen you get you just volunteered don't volunteer for things on bs and beer because then we try to make them happen this has been uh, recorded yeah that's right yeah, yeah, yeah. and a lot of people will hear it uh, can You're I a professor, go? you've got plenty of time, right? Yeah, just loads, loads of time. <laughs> um, Jacob, can I ask you a question? You, you mentioned earlier um, the market has to demand it, and I feel like that's kind of the role I'm in. But like, wh what are some things that relative to the, these types of situations, I mean, from my perspective, it's immensely hard to connect with a contractor that understands this stuff. And if I've got a demand something like what should i be what would be what would be like the top two or three things to ask a contractor to you know like you know like for instance like do they do like what are some vetting questions like do you know what gutex is do you you know like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know like those sort of those sort of things if i'm gonna if i'm gonna be in charge of demanding that what am i asking for like what that's, do I need? right that's an awesome question it is um so I'm going to answer that, but first I want to uh, just sort of caveat my, my position there because I often can't even remember what I've said. So thank you for reflecting back something that I mentioned to make sure that I actually said that accurately. I see a systems view to the market the same way as I see a systems view to everything. And I, I'm speaking as someone that has quite literally had to work for like 15 years to develop the market that we now serve from like scratch because there wasn't like this roaring demand for like high performance natural building that we just like swooped in to fill. It was like very much, um, to, you know, working to educate and, and I mean, again, like create a vision and inspiration that yes, it's actually okay to ask for buildings that are healthy and high performance and using local materials. Like, yep, we can ask for that and demand that. And so it's where the market demanding it. And then us as designers and builders, actually being able to say that that's a thing that we can offer and is, and is a potential. So there's a there's a, an iterative and interactive relationship there. Um, but in terms from the consumer side, like what what would you ask for to, to sort of vet uh, sort of a sympathetic relationship with your designer or builder? I think one great place to start is tell me what you know about air tightness and like just, or what's your approach to air tightness? And from that, like just that, I can just boil it down to that one question. Because from that question, you're gonna learn do they understand whether or not that's a thing, which is like a legitimate question. And if they don't, they're not like, you're, you're just not yeah, going to yeah. get there. And if they do get there and ask a little more about like, well, what's your approach? What's your strategy? Do they mention ventilation? Do they know the difference between air and vapor as different things that have, you know, sort of different control layers or different, different parts of the assembly? Um, do they talk about whether a building can be 
too tight. And if they say that, that's a red flag. Um, you know, it, it, like, it, like that becomes the like an entry point to the whole system of the building and will expose the degree to which folks like really recognize that relationship. Because I think, I mean, I, I have a, a lot of my formative knowledge base around building science, again, from a very empirical direct ways when I got certified as a BPI contractor doing weatherization and retrofit work. That was probably, that was like right in parallel with us needing to like vet out and prove the scientific like viability of our natural wall assemblies was moving from just doing new construction projects to really wanting to engage in the existing built environment and work closer within our own communities and, and a broader economic um, sort of basis to our, our, our sort of client base. And so like, yeah, that was all like building science, you know, applied in existing you know, infrastructure from, from the BPI world. And holy moly, it's all about air barriers and like the relationship with when it's safe to insulate and what the moisture balance is and does that sugar ventilation requirement and where do you place that in the building? Is it the inside? Is it the outside? Like, what do you have to work with? Like, what's your commissioning protocol with a blower? Test? Another thing you could ask, maybe even before this, do you own a blower door test? It's a little bit of an awkward introductory question. Maybe you wouldn't lead with that. That's like, <laughs> what's your sign? I don't know. But I think that like poking at that is like a pretty good like entry point that then allows you based on their answers to like talk about mechanicals or talk about moisture management or talk about like their approach to your enclosure or what have you, um, yeah. Talk so, about your health, talk about your comfort, talk about mm -hmm. your durability. So and how they'll achieve check, it. Check, mm -hmm. check. Totally then. So Jacob, would you then, for somebody like Brian, would you recommend say going to, and I don't know what exists out there in terms of certifications, but um, does it make sense to actually go to their website and see who's certified and then see if geographically it works? Yeah, I mean, I think that different regions have different, um, different uh, like state or regional groups. And so certainly BPI is a national uh, organization and I, just, I'm, I am sure there are others. They're just the ones I'm aware of because that's the, that's the, the world that I've kind of come, come, come up in. Um, I don't mean in any way to suggest they're the only one. I'm sure there's plenty of other really good certification agencies in different different regions. They're more specific to retrofit and renovation worlds. Um, I know here in Vermont, uh, Efficiency Vermont is our local um, right. uh, utility for energy efficiency, and they have their own list of uh, energy efficiency network partners. And uh, you know, we all often reference that list. Like, here are some folks that at least have like a basic working understanding of applied building physics. Like, cause you have to, to be able to be on that list. It doesn't mean that they're good builders. It doesn't mean like, all it means is that they have been exposed to the basic principles of applied building physics and are gonna incorporate that into their practice. So like, that's at least a notable jump. I know that, you know, in our region in New England, um, Nessie uh, as an organization is like, some of the, like the most incredible professionals I know are part of that organization. And so, pointing towards Nessie membership. Again, like you're hard pressed to be part of that organization and not have like a pretty good, honest, solid exposure and foundation in how to do things better, or at least have a curiosity and an interest, an honest interest in trying to do better. And so like, that would be another like organization. I know in the Pacific Northwest, there's um, like the eco, oh gosh, I'm not, I'm not gonna remember the name, the guild, I just called it the guild because I can't remember the whole name, um, but there's some, like pretty amazing builders in that world too. Um, any of those organizations, any sort of group, if you're gonna like join a group with an expressed interest of doing better then like, cool, that pre-validates at least some intention. And like, that's a great place to start in terms of winnowing the field down. Or, or find when a we're... local BPI auditor or HERS auditor in your area and ask them who they're seeing as builders that are doing good work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Our first be. step when talking to new clients is the going to the Passive House website and seeing what builders are in that area. That's usually the first totally. step. And then usually there's not many. Um, and so then you've got to dig, <laughs> dig deeper. But um, that's your energy ready. That's at least a start uh, to understanding some of these. So that's the next list that you might look at. And a lot of those might be production builders. But um, it, it, it's a difficult question. And it's one that I face on like half of the projects that I'm on. So, you know, I would, I would love to be in your shoes sometimes, Jacob, where 
design build. That's where I started uh, my career. And now I'm, you know, just on the design side, which is fun, but, and the consulting side, but uh, it's, it's hard to find the right fit. And usually the other thing I'm looking for is somebody's willingness to, to learn or to experiment, try new things or to listen. Um, and so a lot of times, some of the best projects that I have are a client or a, especially the builder didn't know a lot of this stuff going in, but wants to be a really good quality builder. And by listening and opening up about this stuff and ultimately they change. So I've got a project right now. Um, we started with mineral wool on the in, outside and now the builders on board, they want to do Gutex and they brought that to me. And I was like, great. It's like, that would be my first option. I know that this is on the ocean, but Hey, I, I feel good about it. And so it's, it, it, there's, once you get them to drink the Kool-Aid, like Travis, I think you can get them hooked. <laughs> so. It's beer. It's beer. Jacob, I kind of want to circle back and you've touched on it throughout a bit, but what are some of the other things I'm thinking product wise in particular, um, especially in the bio based materials world, because it's not often you get an opportunity to talk about those things um, to the, to the nth degree. So I'm curious, um, what are some of the things that you might introduce into the book now in terms of materials? Uh, I'll just leave it there. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there's one like, well, there's a bunch of pretty major blind spots in the book. I would say mechanical systems actually was going to be its own book. I was, but like that was going to be one of another ones in the series. We never got there. It didn't happen. I've learned so much more about mechanical design since when it wrote this. So like there's a whole category there that is like, oh, okay, yeah, that could get built out <clears throat> uh, in a major way. Windows I love is a great cow. And then just like directly addressing climate impact um, and the, uh, the emissions profile of materials were like just in the infancy or I was in my infancy, I should say, of really starting to unpack that when I was writing this in 2015, 2016, whenever it was being written. Um, and like that has been my like, whole focus for the last half decade. And like, woof, I like scanned back through this recently. I'm like, I don't even know if I, if the words embodied carbon even show up anywhere in that book. I don't believe that they do. They so do. Like, yep. Oh, they do. Oh, good. Okay. I'm so glad that they're at least said out loud. So, right. First chapter in a box. Okay, good. So it's at least like you touched on. Darren shows the how far right. it was. It was like was. embodied carbon versus operational carbon. Okay, good. So we had like the very 101. And then, yeah, that would be like elevated to a really high criteria in terms of material selection at this point. In terms of materials that are missing, I mean, I think probably as like a product category, the thing that's the least well represented is uh, probably wood fiber board as something that's like now just easier to access that kind of gets, you know, we can spec it. There's, um, you know, there's Gutex, there's Psycho, there's, um, oh God, there's a third that we can get now, whose name I always forget. It's someone wrote in the chat, if you remember. Um, uh, MSR domestically is a thinner product, but it's you know, produced in, um, in Canada. The, you know, the Go Labs are uh, on their way having a, more of a, of a thick insulation panel. Uh, we've used a BP, it's kind of like structural fiber board in the past. So, you know, there's like, that's pretty underrepresented or maybe even entirely missed in the book. And that would be a category of like product that's not showing up. Um, I think what I really would have loved to have done, um, well, I guess in the category of bats, I would have named other ag residue fibers that are now more easily accessible, like hemp bat. Like we can purchase hemp bats and we have, we purchase hemp bats and we put them in walls and you can actually now purchase cellulose bats and put them in walls. Um, so like those are things you can buy and do right now. And so like giving more reference to those alternatives would have been great. Um, I'm gonna like caveat that by saying, I feel like the actual like material selection itself in the one hand is like super critical, super relevant, really important because like that's the thing you buy and install and that's many people's in. And I think what I'm hearing reflected back to me in this conversation is my initial intention, which is to actually frame the question, develop strategies of evaluation, develop the criteria by which we're, we're making decisions. And I really would have, I, I, I look forward to in the next edition, um, really just naming that as a core criteria and building out the building science case and framing the, con the, the sort of the context for embodied carbon emissions and carbon storage potential of biogenic materials within the same 
context as all the other building science-based principles that we're evaluating. Um, and so looking at embodied carbon as yet another criteria um, that overlays with durability and vapor permeability and airtightness and all the other criteria we're assigning to our selection criteria for these different materials and say, this is another one we need to pay attention to. And so talking a little bit about supply chain and understanding the basis of like how our materials are actually arriving to us and what they're made of and getting into the ingredient profile, not just in terms of how it impacts the, the permeability of the material, but also the emissions profile of the material and, and you know, why, you know, there might be a difference in a genetically modified plantation grown two by four versus an FSC certified sort of regionally grown two by four. And that those are actually not the same thing. And they may operate the same way from a, you know, a moisture response saying actually they're not, I'll be, let's be really honest. There's like, even the difference in quality is quite different depending on the, you know, the nature of production and also certainly from the climate's impact and, and getting back to the ecosystem basis. So, you know, I'm starting this entire thing from the context of like looking at first principles. And I wanna give, I realized I didn't actually shout out in the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm mentoring with Andy Shapiro with Energy Balance, who's been my, you know, my primary teacher for the last five years or so. And like he, he has drilled into me first principles and like not relying on the output of an energy model. Like I can't tell you how many like unit conversion worksheets I have developed to try to make sure that all the units are correct when I'm trying to convert from something to something else. And it's the same intention here is like first principles of physics, where's the vapor going? And like just boiling it down to that basis. That's what I'm hearing back has been really critical and relevant and useful in this book. And I apply that exact same criteria in terms of just why bio-based materials are relevant and critical and what validates them as being useful versus potentially harmful and, and where they might, and then trickle down to what are the examples of tangible materials providing different services in different parts of the, in parts of the building and giving some tangible examples. And I think, yeah, again, fiberboard is like a material category that's missing, but what I feel like, and how worse, I, I guess worse about what I wish was in here or look forward to seeing in the next edition is just like, really laying out the case for looking at the, the emissions profiles of materials in the same context as building science. It's not like an either or like, yeah, but the durability. So like, no, 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 no. It's actually the same context that we need to look at climate impact because it totally overlays the durability and a lot of the same properties that make a, you know, like Ben, you're mentioning the like viability of, of petro based, like new fangled space age, you know, like hyper technically derived membranes. Like when I look at the old, 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 old buildings in Vermont that we work on on the regular, like the materials that are still around are like wooden tar paper. So there's a it's reason, a, right? It, it, in, in that vein right there. So, so this is a constant argument because you can shut out the naysayers with this right off the bat. So if we take uh, environment completely out of the equation here, and we take carbon completely out of the equation, the thing that I'm continually being struck by is the fact that these bio-based materials as a whole perform better than the process man-made ones. We haven't even gotten into like discussions about with like wood fiber, cellulose, hemp, about like specific heat capacity, which is something that nobody pays attention to, but makes a real tangible benefit to the performance of the assembly. All of these bio-based products have excellent specific heat capacity. When you look at the plastics, they're terrible. The fiberglasses, they're terrible. The mineral wools, they're terrible. So do yourself a little dive and just start looking at specific heat capacity. But if we take environment completely out of the equation, because there's a lot of people that are, you know, very averse to that conversation. Yeah. If we take that completely out of the equation and just look on the metrics of performance face to face, the bio-based materials are going to continually come out ahead. Problem is the metrics are what people don't look at. They look at the one metric of R value per inch. And so when you look at the greater depth of metrics, that's where they actually do outperform. And so that, that to me has been the trick. The tricky part is, is it's, it's not just our value. There's so much more to it um, in terms of the physics. And so yeah. that's, yes, I, that's why I'm so excited about some of the, the more natural based products, especially the, the fiber based um, different things. I, I'd be curious to hear your latest thoughts, Jacob, on the mushroom foam board products yeah. that you guys have been working with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just want to, like, you just mentioned the R per inch thing. Like, that's like, that's so classic. My closest analog for that is like, how do we think about thermal comfort in our buildings? 
we think about air temperature, right? What defines comfort? 70 degrees Fahrenheit and whatever. Maybe we start talking about relative humidity. Why do we talk about that? Oh. Sorry, I get excited and then I gesticulate and <laughs> my cord out. Um, like, why do we talk about that? Because that's the only thing we have a metric for is because we set a thermostat on our wall. That has, that's actually not the biggest driver of our comfort. Like most of our heat loss is actually the cold surfaces around us. So if we had like a visible metric of mean radiant temperature of all the like, you know, surfaces, the materials surrounding us in the building, and we had like a number that showed up on the wall that we could set, like, cool, we'd have better metrics if we talk about that, but we don't know that. No one's like scanning with a digital, well, most of us aren't scanning our walls with digital thermometers to see what the surface temperatures are. And, and then also like overlaying that with humidity and turbulence and asymmetry and heat stratification and like the eight different factors that actually legitimately contribute to human comfort. Like as a mechanical designer, that's what I'm paying attention to. But as a consumer, like the one metric is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what's the thing that shows up in owner's project requirement or is like, like, am I comfortable or not? Is like what the number is on the wall. And so the same thing with R value. Like, well, I know that it's R bleh, per inch. So that's the one thing I have. And that's where I'm making my decisions from. Like, I totally get that. And oh my God, what a like narrow and like incomplete basis of making decisions. If that's literally the only thing that you're looking at, because it's the only metric you have in, to have handy. And the thing that like was the goal of the book really at the heart and soul of it was to democratize building science. So it's not just well-paid professionals and it isn't just having to hire expensive consultants and, and, you know, like folks that make, you know, way more than a project can actually legitimately bear for carrying costs and soft costs. They're like, okay, if like you apply enough of this, you can like, it'll be better than had you not gone there at all. And that has been such a critical piece for coming from a non-academic, non like, formal basis of training. I didn't even, I had like three and a half years of high school and then went right into owner building in the trades. So like this information has to be accessible in some form and fashion to everybody. So it's not just relying on folks that have degrees that can really figure out what really keeps you comfortable. And so I really appreciate you calling out the R per inch thing. It's like, no, we actually have the collective ability and responsibility to think a little more critically about how to make better decisions around our buildings. And you don't need to come at it from this highly specialized or like elevated plane of knowledge that, you know, you need to spend a thousand dollars an hour and have extra $5,000 budget for in your project to be able to answer the question. Well. Sorry. We well, touched over. on that a little bit with radiant barriers, which was great to, to talk ah. about, oh, I've got, you know, an R hundred paint that I can put on my walls. Um, you know, so right. at least I'm glad that you mentioned that briefly. I remember 10, maybe 12 years ago when I first started as a consultant in this industry, the client, uh, reached out to us on a commercial project and they were like, Hey, we, we found this product or somebody recommended this product to us. And it was this insulating paint. And we're like, that sounds not possible. And so, you know, after some Googling, <laughs> we realized it's uh, some gigantic scam and, you know, 12 years later, it's still a product that you can buy. Um, so it, it's interesting. The one thing I do appreciate from the differences of just founding R value per inch is the natural fiber based insulation especially like Gutex and Styco, they are doing a pretty good job in terms of marketing, not just the R value per inch, but also the other metrics that we've been talking about. Um, and they're, they're little demonstrations of let's make the cooler and put the light inside and see how much energy it takes. And um, oh, it outperforms the phone by a lot. And so it, it's cool to see some of those demonstrations because I think it'll click for other people. It's getting there. You, I didn't want to okay. answer your question about mushrooms, though. I can answer it really, actually, really quickly. I didn't want to just like leave that dangling. Really, I just answered a different question, which is not super uh, responsible of me. Um, yeah, I am so pumped for that to actually take off. So we've been using the the microfoam panels in our doors. So we uh, New Framework also does a line of high performance natural doors, and that was very Griffin much doors. Like, Griffin doors, pun <laughs> completely intended. Um, and that was filling a need that like existed for us. There just wasn't a really good, like natural high performance airtight door product out there. Um, it's, uh, so Ecovative was, is the company in New York that we have initially been sourcing those from. I'm actually not a hundred percent sure right now in real time uh, what the supply is for that. I know we've also been using a lot of sheep's wool as well. They have sort of changed. They had been working on getting a um, insulation product 
uh, a, a formerly an insulation, building insulation product out there. It's a wicked hard market relative to their other markets of, um, you know, like packing materials, which is like way lower bar. Um, and now they've sort of changed their business model a bit towards licensing their technology for other manufacturers to develop their own products, which I think is pretty legit. But we haven't seen the like, we're definitely not the place where you can get like mushroom boards in you know your local building supply center. Um, that said, we were able to get, and I, I actually don't know current immediate status, but up until pretty recently, we were able to get um, like smaller form panels that were perfect for insulating our doors. I, it would be impractical to do entire walls of a whole building. Um, but in our relatively small application for doors, it was like bang on and thermal performance is good and moisture performance works for us. It's like a lower risk environment being totally encased within a door. So using that to our advantage. Um, but I, th that's like exactly the type of like, cool, if we're going to apply technology and look for a technological solution, which I have, I, we could talk a whole long time about like looking towards technology as a mechanism for solving the world's problems. I have like mixed opinions about that, but there is a role for that. And using that level of a bio-based solution is super exciting to me. I think there's a lot of potential there. So, so I've got two oh. questions coming out of the chat here and then one, sorry, Emily. <laughs> I was going to say, this is the point in the night when I usually tell people they need to wrap it up. So Ben, if you're going to have the final say. I, well, I've got, I've got <laughs> some here. So first off, this is a totally selfish question on my end uh, that I'd like an answer to is, uh, when are we going to get the beam calculator? Ah, ha, ha. I should uh, formally allow Chris Magwood to answer that in the chat because Very that's uh, more his department than mine. I've been helping, but I'm not responsible. Did for you say state. beam? Because I know yeah. he's working on the. Is that's it? the that's the embodied carbon. That's the carbon calculator. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's gonna be so great. It's so awesome. You're yeah, he's the top. I keep asking all. about it too. Chris, uh, what's the answer? What's the latest? I've been waiting for the press us. release. And then the Most other the question that uh, got seconded quite a few times is, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, panelized straw bale construction? Yeah, thanks for asking. Oh, yes. So Sorry to drag this like... longer, Emily. And I'll, um, I'll try to answer quickly. Um, I can't answer anything quickly. What the hell am I talking about? Um, <laughs> I'll just be cognizant of the fact that I may run slightly late and if you need to leave at 7.30, thank you and goodbye. Um, so we have, that's the second like product offering from new frameworks is Griffin panels. So Griffin is now our product line. Now that we have more than one panel or more product. And so we have started producing um, prefabricated structural straw insulated panels. Uh, we're not the first ones. Um, actually, speaking of Chris Magwood, that dude's been doing this for like 20 years. So this is like, we've learned a ton from him. Uh, he's been huge, uh, like direct uh, inspiration for us in formulating our approach. Um, as has Eco Cocoon, I want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Peter Jensen in New York, uh, uh, who's been important, he's the US distributor for Eco Cocoon, who's been doing straw panel, prefab straw panel work in Europe for a long time. They have like got 100 passive houses under their belt using that system. Mod cell in the UK, um, sit up panels in Australia. Uh, there's probably like five or six other ones around the world that I'm, I'm uh, and, and, not thinking of. And there's that huge abbey in Europe. It's either, it's in, maybe it's in Bavaria. Have you, have you, it's just, I'll send you the link. It's, oh, please do. It's, yeah, it's put it in the chat. Phenomenal. Oh, I love it. Um, so, yeah, so this is just new frameworks response to the same thing where. I mean, for all practical purposes, it's we're basically just building double stud wall boxes and stuffing them with straw. It's like actually pretty simple. Um, the whole point was to make it, well, okay, there's a handful of points and I'll just try to be pretty brief with that because I know we're running short on time. So one, we still wanna make it a lot easier to get straw into buildings. I am not like straw is the answer to everything. It's totally not. And it's like just one of a whole series of different materials, but it's, in our region, in our practice, in our experience, it's one of the better solutions we have in, in the like uh, finding the ellipsis in the center of the Venn diagram of all these different priorities that we're trying to like highlight. Um, it could also be hemp, it could also be rice hull, it could also be sugarcane bagasse, it could also be 17 other regional ag agricultural products. So the point of our design was to make like a structurally robust box it's easy to fill with whatever your most appropriate agricultural waste bio-based resources so that it can be highly adaptable to a variety of different climates for us it happens to be straw so that's the basis of our design 
Um, it was also really important that we can bring straw to a much broader market than just like the custom straw bale market because I mean, there's just the market isn't that big for folks that really want specifically straw. There's not that many people that know how to detail with that. And we just want to be able to get the material out there in a much easier way so that now someone can put down the foundation, wall panels go up. And then if you didn't want to know or didn't know to ask, you would never know that it's straw. Roof goes on top, siding on the outside, whatever on the inside. And like, great, you have all the benefits of straw without it having to be like a specialized crew with specialized detailing and the specialized thing. It can just fold into more of a conventional product development workflow um, and just have it be able to get out there more. It was really important in that, like I'm, you can pretty probably clearly tell my like MO around like democratization of, you know, access to all these technologies to like smaller scale organizations. I didn't want to, like we felt really strongly that this needs to be really low capitalization, low tech startup that more people had access and entry into being able to develop and do themselves. That's like the ethos of the natural building movement in general is a very DIY, like direct access to shelter kind of, kind of ethos. And like, that's pretty relevant here too. It needs to not be like a million dollar startup campaign to set up your straw bale manufacturing facility. Like sure, I'm sure we could put that money to use, but really we're putting these together like in our shop using some really inexpensive forms and able to like crank these out in a pretty basic form so that rather than scaling up to some like 500,000 square foot manufacturing facility run by CNC machines, you'd rather just see 500,000 of these models replicated across North America so that prefabrication doesn't have to be this, you know, inaccessible technological like leap and can be something that more companies have greater access to and a broader demographical diversity of people can have access to because let's be honest, it's a very small number of our demographic that has access to the type of capital to develop pretty manufactured building solutions. Whereas if you can scrape together like five grand in the shop, then like a whole lot more people that have a whole lot harder access to capital could actually start doing this with their own materials in the region. So part of this is developing a model that is part of this whole concept of movement building within our smaller scale economy, smaller building forms, smaller building products, smaller company scale that gives us the same access to the benefits of prefabrication and working with a broader diversity of alternative materials and doing it with all the metrics of both like climate impact and human health and building performance all able to be held. So yeah, that's a, maybe like the overall concept, our overall like gestalt around it. There's more info on our website for folks that want to check it out. Um, but yeah, we've just started kind of rolling those out as um, we had been using them for our own product projects. And now we're offering them available for other projects um, to be able to be installed and delivered with the hope that there's 500,000 of these, you know, similar types of approaches being done in Midwest and all the other great regions that have a lot of agricultural residue that could be packed into buildings and perform a really long time in, a, in an upcycled kind of way. I'm just, For those yeah. of who don't know, um, in terms of why straw, straw is one of the best options in terms of embodied carbon. Um, stores a lot, it can be harvested. And the other, what I learned from you and Chris, um, about five times the amount of straw gets decomposed and wasted in fields every year, five times more than the insulation industry as a whole in the United States. So it's not like there's enough, uh, there's, there's more straw than we need to, to actually switch everything over to straw as our insulation option. That thought alone is, is a totally out there idea in terms of holistic th systems thinking. It's like, imagine if we could just put one of these plants, one of these 500 or 500,000 or whatever you said there, um, at each one of these fields where they're, they have wheat production. I mean, you can take all of this straw and turn it into panels and all of our insulation could be that. Not that it should, but it could. And that alone, I think, is a really fascinating idea um, and eventually could be less expensive than standard construction, possibly. My, just my, my closing thought here, Jacob, personally, I'm a little disappointed. With Gryffindors, I'm surprised that you didn't go for Huffle panels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not too late to rebrand. 
Oh, oh my gosh, that's freaking brilliant. Oh, oh the nail in the coffin. Okay. Okay. I couldn't resist. Wow, I'm taking that I one home. Think... Ben, thank you. Where were you a year ago? <laughs> yeah. the, we can't say anything voice. else after that. That right. was, that's that was that, a perfect like, ending to the show. Punctuation point, right? Yeah. So for anybody who didn't get their questions asked tonight, Kylie will post this up on the GBA forum. Please go over there, uh, post your comments. Um, if you want to save the chat box and there are three dots on the bottom of your chat box screen, you can save the chat box from there. If not, uh, let us know and we can probably get you a copy of the chat box. Everyone have a great night. Thank you so much, Jacob, and all of our panelists for joining us tonight on the show. Thank pleasure so as always. Much. Real pleasure. Thanks, Thanks all. Bye all.